Hello and welcome. This is the introduction to chapter 8. Chapter 8 is on the topic of chemical bonding. So some of the ideas in chapter 8 on the concepts of chemical bonding include Lewis symbols and the octet rule. This is maybe what you can think of for oxygen, thinking of it as a 2s2, 2p4. So we might be picturing oxygen as something that has six valence electrons surrounding it. So we might think of our octet uh, rule possibly as oxygen wanting to ideally obtain those two extra electrons either through making an O2 minus ion or perhaps through making and sharing two bonds with other atoms, maybe like sharing its electrons with hydrogen where we have two electrons being shared across the bond that we can express in this Lewis structure of the molecule water. So we'll talk about ionic bonding in the early part of chapter eight, try to figure out what it is that holds ionic compounds together. We can probably appreciate right now that it's the electrostatic forces of attraction of the anions uh, with cations. So maybe we can form something like calcium oxide where we get this strong ionic attraction between the calcium and the oxide ions. Then we'll talk about covalent bonding and get into bond polarity, electronegativity, talk about how different atoms have a different desire for electrons once we're making bonds. We can probably gain some appreciation for molecules, say like lithium fluoride, being a plus minus ionic compound, and then HF being something that we can appreciate as being partially ionized, though being a molecular compound <clears throat> with this polar bond. And then maybe something like F2, where we have two fluorine atoms bonded together, where each atom equally pulls on the two electron pairs in the bond, and then each of them simply have a partial charge of zero. So no charge developing in the case of F2. So we might imagine how we can have some ionic compounds like LIF. This is our metals and nonmetals. We can have some polar bonds where we have some relatively um, highly electronegative atoms paired up with some of the lesser electronegative atoms like H and F. This is actually one of the most, this actually is the most polar of the molecular bonds that we'll be considering. And then the case where we have some nonpolar bonds where we end up with a completely equal sharing of electrons across the nuclei in the uh, bond. So we'll go through some examples of that as we get through the chapter, as we then try to finish up with drawing Lewis structures, talking about things called resonance structures. We'll see some Lewis structures violate the octet rule. For many of these molecules, that's perfectly reasonable. Um, and they still can exist as stable molecules, though sometimes not always following this octet rule, the octet rule being you know, eight total electrons surrounding an atom. We'll see many examples of atoms that actually don't um, have this preference in some of their Lewis structures. And then finally, we'll remind ourselves of some of the strengths of chemical bonds, but we'll try to link those up with more on um, the ideas of lengths of bond here in this chapter. So we'll try to pick up that our triple bonds are usually stronger and hence shorter than things like our single bonds. So if we're like looking at like a nitrogen, nitrogen, that's a triple bond versus the oxygen, oxygen, double bond. This bond here is actually shorter than the double bond is between the two atoms. So we can look at the bonding type here and really think of these bonding electrons are serving as the glue that's holding these nuclei together. So we have three major types of bonds we encounter in nature. We have ionic bonds. These are the type of bonds that holds the ions together within ionic compounds. We can think about how solid sodium chloride would be a tremendous number of plus and minus ions where we have the electrostatic forces of attraction keeping the ions held together. That's our ionic bond. Our covalent bond is the case of the bonding in molecules like water. So we have two electrons being shared between each of the O and H bonds in this molecule. So each line represents two electron pairs that are being shared across the bond. One thing that's kind of interesting is to, um, and once we get through the chapter, you get a gauge of how strong bonds are for the covalent bonds. But we saw this in chapter five, that breaking this bond is about four to 500 kJs per mole. We'll see here soon that breaking a mole of an ionic bond is about usually 800 or so kJs per mole. So ionic bonds generally a little bit stronger than covalent bonds. Metallic bonding is actually very strong bonding. It's a type of bonding present in, in um, metals like iron solid, sodium solid. One of the things that's interesting in particular with iron is if you think about how it has eight valence electrons. A lot of valence electrons and then a high positive charge for the nuclei. So you can think we have these nuclei that are positively charged. All these electrons that kind of act as almost a sea of electrons surrounding these nuclei. 
It's an interesting contrast here. It's like you have two electrons on a covalent bond that are located specifically between two nuclei. In the case of ionic bonding, you have the case of having electrons that are very specifically on one atom and like no longer on the other. That's why you get these plus and minus cations. In the case of iron, you almost have all these electrons that just flow among all the nuclei such that you can't even really figure out which electrons belong to any of the particular nuclei within the metal structure. What this um, sea of electron bonding model that sometimes is described for metals, it's described a little bit more in chapter 12. So there's more of a description of this topic later um, within this course. But this is a somewhat uh, easy way to understand the conductive nature of metals. If you can find a way to remove an electron from one end of the metal, so you create a tiny little positive charge by removing an electron, all the other electrons in the metal can easily respond by flowing towards that positive charge. So you can perhaps understand the electrical conductivity of metals through the sea of electron model. But metallic bonding is the type of bonding that holds our metal atoms together and it's a very strong form of bonding. It's why metals often have very high melting points. Lewis symbols are a way of describing the valence electrons around a central atom with a little bit of intuition of how the atom might use those electrons to form bonds with other elements. For example, lithium has one valence electron, so it has one dot. Beryllium, two valence electrons, two dots, but we draw a dot on either side, so perhaps it could pair up and bond with atoms on either side. So if you imagine a dot structure of beryllium like this, perhaps it can pair up with two H atoms and make two bonds on either side. If you imagine the Lewis dot structure of boron, three dots for its three valence electrons, so perhaps it can pair up and make bonds with three H atoms. So if you imagine a hydrogen atom, we pair up and make a single bond between it and the boron atom. If you imagine this with carbon, so maybe we'll make CH4, that's a stable molecule of methane with NH3 ammonia. Maybe we'll put three NHs on here, leave a lone pair behind. Of course, we know water is very stable, two hydrogens, leaving behind two lone pairs of electrons. And then we'll leave three pairs of electrons and come up with a stable molecule in the case of HF. And then neon is already stable due to having that noble gas configuration of electrons without sharing its electrons with any other atom, so it just stands still as a noble gas. So the octet rule, atoms tend to gain, lose, or share electrons until they're surrounded by this noble gas count of electrons. So hydrogen picks up that count with two electrons because that's neon's noble gas count, and then oxygen picks up the total of eight electrons surrounding it through covalent bonding. Of course, something like oxygen could pick up two electrons and form the two minus ion if it were to go ionic. So we can add um, electrons to obtain this noble gas count as well. And then perhaps other elements, maybe magnesium, can take its two electrons and just lose them and form the two plus ion. So these atoms can gain, lose, share electrons until they obtain this special uh, configuration of electrons that makes them have a greater stability. Now, some of the times it actually isn't even a noble gas count. We'll pick up a few molecules that actually form stable compounds without necessarily forming with this uh, or obeying the octet rule as we proceed through this chapter. So let's take a little bit more of a look at ionic bonding. So ionic bonds result from the case of having metals on the left side of the periodic table because those are the elements that have a low ionization energy. And then pairing up with the non-metallic elements, those that have a relatively favorable electron affinity. So generally negative in terms of the electron affinity here. So if you think of sodium, it takes about 500 kJs per mole for it to lose an electron. And then we gain about 300 or so kJs per mole back when we put the electron and have it absorb into the shell of chlorine to make the chloride ion. Now that alone isn't energetic enough, or like we don't have gaseous ions that float away, instead we end up having, not H, we end up having the NaCl form, where we, once the ions form, we then get their electrostatic attraction. So then we get the benefit of this Q1, Q2 divided by D as they stick together and form an ionic solid. So the reason why NaCl forms is not just because of the energetics of sodium losing electron chloride absorbing the electron, but then once you form the plus and the minus ions, they're then electrostatically attracted together, and then there's an energy of attraction of the molecule 
due to those charges. Now lattice energy is a way that we can gauge how strong an ionic bond is. Lattice energy is the energy required to completely separate one mole of a solid ionic compound into its gaseous ions. Let's take a look at sodium chloride. So taking NaCl, this ionic compound, separating it into sodium and chloride has a lattice energy of about 800, it's about 788 kJs per mole. If you think of this number relative to covalent bond strengths, it's a fair bit stronger than most of our covalent bonds. So pretty strong in the case of ionic bonds. Now two things we can do to strengthen the bond would be to actually make the ions smaller. So something like LIF, smaller lithium ion, smaller fluoride ion, same plus one minus one. This would separate into lithium plus gas plus F minus gas. We'd expect the lattice energy of lithium fluoride, of this lithium fluoride, fluoride compound, to be greater than the lattice energy of NaCl. And it'd be higher by maybe 100 or so kJs per mole. Not necessarily by a whole lot, but it'd be higher uh, nevertheless. Now if we compare these lattice energies to maybe that of Ca2 plus O2 minus, so CaO, breaking apart to calcium 2 plus, O2 minus, separating a 2 plus and a 2 minus ion is going to take a fair amount of greater energy. So the delta H, the lattice energy here for CaO is going to be on the order of about four to five times higher that of NaCl. This value here is about 3,500 kJs per mole, approximately. So a lot higher in the case of CaO because we're now separating ions that have a greater charge. So lattice energy we'll see is uh, greatly dependent upon the size of the ions, but then also uh, much more highly dependent on the charges of the ions. Let's take a look at a chart comparing a lot of different lattice energies. So this chart here is comparing several different lattice energies, so LIF to Cl to I. As we increase the size of the halide ion, we get a drop in the lattice energy. Um, as we imagine doing this for sodium, fluoride, chloride, bromide, iodide, we also get a drop in the lattice energy. As we also maybe compare going from uh, lithium fluoride to sodium fluoride to potassium fluoride and increasing the metal ion, notice that we're going from 1030 to 910 to 808 kJs per mole. Generally speaking, the lattice energy is also going to be proportional to the uh, melting point of the compound. So compounds that have a greater lattice energy usually have a higher melting point. So this is related to some fundamental properties of a molecule. So we usually see a dependence here of lattice energy on things like melting point. So compounds that have a two plus minus sort of behavior have a higher melting point in general because they have the higher lattice energy because they have more highly charged ions. And then also if you have a two plus, two minus, it's even more pronounced that the two plus two minus ions have an even higher lattice energy. So you can see the lattice energies of the plus one minus ones, about 600 to 1000 uh, kJs per mole is our range here. If you double the charge of one of the ions, you roughly double the lattice energy. So we now are looking at lattice energies of about 2000 or so kJs per mole. If you double the charge of both ions, we're almost multiplying those lattice energies by about a factor of four. So now we're in about the three to 4000 kJ per mole range. And then look at three plus three minus in the case of scandium nitride, this compound has a humongously high uh, lattice energy. So about 7,500 kJs per mole because of this more highly charged three plus three minus set of ions require much more energy to separate those into their gaseous counterparts. So now if we compare and contrast a little bit with covalent bonding, uh, covalent bonding is the case where we're going to share electrons between our nuclei as opposed to one of the nuclei keeping a hold of those electrons like ionic bonds do. So in terms of a uh, probability distribution, our electron has the highest probability of being found in between the nuclei and still a little bit of a higher probability of being found at the actual nuclei itself um, or closest toward any one of the particular nuclei at any given moment. One thing that's important is that the electrons still repel each other, but they are the glue holding these nuclei together. So that's ultimately what's holding the two nuclei together to make this type of bond. 
So if we compare some Lewis structures, what we might be thinking here, if you take a hydrogen atom, another hydrogen atom, each with one valence electron, we share those two electrons across the two H atoms. Something you might pick up is that if H2 is going to form with an overall neutral charge and each atom brings with it its one valence electron for a total of two valence electrons. Let's compare with chlorine. We have seven valence electrons for each of the chlorines times two, 14 total electrons. A Lewis structure should show all of the valence electrons, not necessarily all the core electrons as well, but just the valence electrons. And so if we picture each of the chlorine atoms, we might think of the Lewis dot diagrams, orient them at each other, and then just pair up the two electrons. So now we have each of the chlorine with two, four, six, eight electrons surrounding it. The other one, of course, two, four, six, eight as well. So we're satisfying each of the chlorine's octets by sharing the electron pair with a covalent bond. And so then in the case of HCl, maybe we take an H and a Cl, pair them up. So Lewis dot diagrams sometimes are helpful for coming up with Lewis structures. We'll see that we have a few different ways of trying to sketch or draw a Lewis structure. One of the other ways might be to consider these valence electrons and then try to find a way to distribute them across the nuclei through a more comprehensive set of roles that we'll be going over towards the end of the video. So let's compare and contrast HF, H2O, and H3 with CH4. We were discussing these earlier when we were pointing out that one, the 1H pairs up with fluoride. Now notice that we don't have, for a stable molecule, any other H's that can pair up with fluoride. So fluoride st stands sort of still with these three lone pairs and this one bonding pair of electrons. Now one of the sort of topics that we'll talk about a lot in this chapter is calculating the formal charge of an atom. So imagine we have an oxygen atom that has this configuration here. You would say we have two, four, six, eight valence electrons, or excuse me, two, four, five, six electrons surrounding oxygen. This would be an uncharged oxygen atom if it were to have six valence electrons. So an ordinary oxygen atom has six valence electrons and if it does so it has a zero charge. The O atom in this box has six electrons surrounding it. So this O atom has a formal charge of zero. So we can calculate the formal charge of oxygen here and find that it's zero. H has one electron surrounding it. And so then we can say it has a formal charge of zero as well. So this idea of formal charge, what it does is it assumes that the bonding pair electrons and the covalent bonds are equally shared. Hence, one of the electrons is closer to one of the atoms and the other to the other atom. And what this allows us to do is try to consider what the net charge of the atoms would be given this covalent behavior. If we look at nitrogen, break its bonds in half. So we have three electrons closer to the N, one in each of the bonds closer to the H, that gives each of these atoms a zero formal charge as well. So one thing that's interesting for nitrogen is it forms stable molecules very often with one lone pair of electrons and three bonding pairs of electrons. That gives it, uh, the nitrogen atom an octet and then also a zero formal charge. Carbon accomplishes uh, this with a uh, zero formal charge by having four bonding pairs of electrons and then zero pairs of electrons. That's so it has four Electrons would give it a zero charge, and it's surrounded by four electrons. So it still has a zero formal charge. Think about fluorine. It should have seven electrons for an, uh, a charge of zero, and it's surrounded by seven electrons. So fluorine's accomplishing this task of forming stable molecules very often with three pairs of electrons and one bonding pair. So some molecules are slightly more complicated. If you picture, perhaps, a carbon atom, four valence electrons, oxygen, six valence electrons. Maybe we can pair up and make a double bond here, make a double bond here. Maybe we end up with something that looks like this, where we have two pairs of electrons being spread across the oxygen and the carbon atom. So we would call this a double bond. So we'd have four electrons being shared across that one double bond, and then another four electrons being spread across the other double bond. So in this molecule here, we have eight total bonding pairs of electrons, and each of the O's has four non-bonding electrons. Now we'll see another approach later allows us to maybe consider counting up the electrons and distributing them, thinking about the charge of the central atom. So there's going to be other ways that lead us to this Lewis structure. And then for some molecules that maybe aren't as common as CO2 or maybe not as memorable as CO2, maybe we can figure out their Lewis structures as well. For something like N2, we can pair up, make a triple bond that gives each of the N atoms an octet and also at the same time satisfying a formal charge of zero for each of the N atoms. If we imagine breaking this bond in half, 
Each of the ends have a total of five electrons surrounding it, giving each of the end atoms a zero charge. If you imagine taking oxygen, two atoms of O, of course oxygen is just going to make a double bond. So we make a double bond here in the case of O2. Again, zero formal charges on both of the O's, satisfying the octet rule at the same time as well. So now let's think about how the electrons are actually shared across the um, atoms within real bonds. So bond polarity is a measure of how equally or unequally the electrons are shared within a covalent bond. And a nonpolar bond, the electrons are shared equally. This is always the case whenever we have a non, or whenever we have one of these types of bonds where the atom is exactly the same. So if we have a molecule like F2, neither one of the Fs has a greater pole for these two electrons, so they're equally shared. And the two atoms are exactly zero in terms of their actual charge, and as well zero in the case of their formal charges. Now contrast this with a polar covalent bond like HF. Now the difference here is a tug of war can be established where fluorine is smaller, has a higher effective charge, has a greater ability to pull these two electrons closer towards itself. Now think about this for a second. Imagine LAF where lithium is trying to make this bond here like HF does. Now the problem with lithium is that it has such a low ionization energy. Hydrogen's ionization energy is pretty high. Lithium's is actually much lower. If you remember, the ionization energy of H is on the order of about 1,300 kJs per mole. Lithium's only on the order of about 500 kJs per mole. So now fluorine has a much higher pull, such that with lithium, it's not even a contest at all. And, and fluorine completely steals that electron off lithium and forms with this minus one charge lithium with a plus charge. So this would be, uh, you know, the fluoride ion here on one unit of LAF would have a charge of 1.6 minus 1.602 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. The charge on lithium would be plus 1.602 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. This is just simply the charge of one electron. So the charge of one electron equals 1.602 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. So now think about HF. HF, the F's going to pull the electron pair more than h but it's going to go somewhere between zero and minus one and then h is going to go between somewhere between zero and plus one so the real charge we'll actually work this out later the real charge on f ends up being about 0 uh, 0.44 and it's negative in terms of the charge relative to an electron and the charge on h ends up being about plus 0 0.44 electrons so it's almost 50-50. It's like 50% ionized, if you will, where lithium fluoride would be more like 100% ionized. So fluoride adopts or ends up with a slight bit of charge, or actually in this case, maybe a fair bit of charge, where it's about halfway between a charge of zero and a charge of minus one. And that's just this electron pair shading closer towards the fluorine. So let's compare and contrast F2. Neither of the fluorines obtains a charge different from the other. Both of them end up forming with a zero charge. HF forms with a charge of about minus 0.44 electron units. We'll see how we can calculate that in a, at a later time. The positive charge ends up on the H atom. And then lithium fluoride ends up forming with a plus and the full minus charge and forms a real distinct ionic compound. So HF somewhere in between, that's our polar covalent bond. So now if we compare electronegativity, fluorine has the highest electronegativity of all the elements on the periodic table. What electronegativity is, is it's a measure of the relative desire for electrons within uh, bonds. So fluorine is going to pull electrons more closely towards itself. This is a function of fluorine having a relatively high effective charge and then a really small size. So fluorine can really have a strong impact on pulling electrons towards itself. Now you might recall that iodine technically has a higher effective charge than fluorine, but the problem with iodine is it's much bigger than fluorine. So being bigger doesn't allow iodine to has, have as strong of a pull uh, towards itself for electrons and bonds. Fluorine forms some interesting compounds. If you imagine some of these mixed compounds like instead of F2, imagine fluorine in the case of one, iodine in the case of the other, Fluorine keeps the minus charge, iodine goes positive, because fluoride smaller has a greater pull towards itself for that electron pair. And that's the explanation of why its electronegativity is greater than something like 
iodine. Okay, so whenever we're looking at a compound, what we might do is look at a, a Lewis structure, look at the formal charge, the formal charge would be zero, and then think about how the bond uh, electronegativity is going to favor one of the atoms changing its charge. In this case, it's the fluorine that goes negative and the hydrogen that goes positive. So the more electronegative atom is going to pull the bonding pair electrons closer toward itself. So now um, the electronegativities of our metals are pretty low. So if you pair a metal up with a non-metal, you're getting this ionic behavior, the ionic compounds resulting. If you pair hydrogen up due to its higher ionization energy, it's going to keep some of that electron closer towards itself and then form these polar covalent type bonds as opposed to the ionic bonds like the metals do. Now I'm going to demonstrate the Lewis structure role before we actually take a look at them. What I might do if I'm coming up with a Lewis structure for PCL5 is write the valence count of phosphorus 3 times 7 for the chlorines. That gives me a total of 26 electrons that I have to distribute. So this is my valence count. These are the electrons I have to distribute across P Cl. What I usually want to do is single bond the atoms first to the non, uh, single bond the non-central atoms, the outer atoms, to the central atom, and complete the non-central atoms octets. I don't necessarily immediately put an electron pair on the central atom. I wait to see if I have electrons left over. So at this point, I've distributed 24 electrons onto the molecule. I have two electrons left over. Those electrons go onto the central atom. So we put the leftover electrons, if there are any, onto the central atom. So some central atoms may be deficient of an octet. We're not adding electron pairs to fill octets unless we have them available within the molecule. Um, so we had them in the case of PCL3. So this ends up being the Lewis structure of PCL3. The last consideration would be if we have uh, the ability or the need to make any multiple bonds, and we don't because we have zero formal charges across this molecule. The phosphorus has a zero formal charge as well. The formal charges should all sum up to the charge of the molecule, which is zero, so that works out as well. And then finally, we have the octet being satisfied on phosphorus, so there's no need to really consider any other structures in this one for PCL3. Now for HCN, we have two basic ideas. One is a dot diagram, and this doesn't work so bad. This works pretty, pretty easily, actually. So you can pair up, make a triple bond, and then a single bond. So you end up making H, C, triple bond, N, lone pair. And then this actually keeps our general rule, our general idea that nitrogen forms with a zero formal charge, carbon with a zero, hydrogen with a zero formal charge. Now we could also get there by adding up our valence electrons, identifying carbon as our central atom, single bond the nitrogen and the hydrogen, give the non-central atom an octet, then calculate a formal charge, we get a 2 plus for this carbon, and we'd have a 2 minus for the nitrogen. So what I'm going to do is make a double bond. That's going to drop this formal charge here. As those electrons move in, that's going to drop this formal charge now down to minus. This formal charge here to positive, so that's good. We've reduced the magnitudes of our formal charge. That's generally a good thing within Lewis structures. And then we can do this one more time. We take this electron pair, move them in. And then in the process, we make a triple bond. And then once we make the triple bond, we then have zero formal charge on carbon. Four minus four is zero. And then on nitrogen, five minus five is also zero. So we have a zero formal charge on the nitrogen. And this electron pair has moved in to the bonding pair. So we can end up with this molecule in two different ways, Lewis dot diagram, or by thinking of some slightly more um, generalized rules for drawing Lewis structures. Now let's think of the valence, uh, excuse me, of the Lewis structure rules for CO2. First count up the valence electrons. That's 16 total. Central carbon. non-central O's. I complete the non-central atom octets, calculate a formal charge at this point, no electrons left over. I've distributed the 16 electrons, none left over, so no lone pairs for carbon. And so then I have minus formal charges on the uh, oxygen atoms. I can reduce those formal charge, make a double bond here, do the same thing with the other atom of oxygen. We end up making 
a double bond. We lose those electron pairs. And then in the process, we're reducing the magnitudes of formal charge. So now the formal charge in these atoms would be zero for O, zero for C, and zero for the other O. Now one thing you might wonder is, well, why might we rule out this Lewis structure here? You may, uh, I don't know if you would necessarily even consider this as a possible Lewis structure, but this isn't a good one because our formal charge here is minus on this O, positive on the other O, and in general, we should choose a Lewis structure that minimizes the formal charges when possible. So we want to minimize the formal charges when we're generally satisfying the octet rule the same in either case. So if we're looking at these two different structures and we see in both cases we're satisfying the octet rules for both atoms, we're going to ultimately choose the one that minimizes the magnitudes of formal charge on the molecule, not the ones that maximize those formal charges. Now let's go through the rules for NCS with a minus charge. So let's also see how we take care of a minus charge. So we have five for the nitrogen, valence count four for carbon, six for sulfur, one for the charge. We gotta add one electron for the minus charge. That gives me a total of 16 electrons. So we probably wouldn't be too surprised to see that a structure just like CO2, we can draw some analogies that might help us. So the CO2 analogy, or analogous structure would be this one. We can actually possibly come up with three other ideas that are gonna equally satisfy the octet rule. And so then that's one of them. And then let's imagine uh, this structure here. Now this one is especially bad because I have a two minus charge here on that nitrogen, and I have a plus charge on this S. If I look over here, I have a zero formal charge on nitrogen and a minus one on the sulfur. If I look over here, I have a minus one on the N and a zero on the sulfur. So I can really rule out the last one because that has higher magnitudes of formal charge while still satisfying the octet rule equally as in the other two cases. So these two cases here are gonna be better than the third because we've minimized the magnitudes of formal charge. But now the question is, do we choose a structure with the minus one charge on N or the minus one charge on S? Now, whenever we're satisfying the octet rule equally in both structures, and the only issue is the difference in formal charges, we're gonna to look to whether N versus the S, which one has the greater ability to pull electrons towards itself, which atom has a higher electronegativity, and that's nitrogen. So nitrogen's more electronegative, so we choose this Lewis structure here for NCS minus because the nitrogen is going to have a greater pull of electrons towards itself and be more likely to be the negatively charged atom as opposed to sulfur, which is less electronegative. So we're not going to preferentially put the minus charge on the sulfur. So we can choose between um, e uh, uh, structures that might satisfy the octet rule equally, but then places a different formal charge on some of the atoms. And we want the more negative charges to wind up on the more negative atoms, more uh, on the more electronegative atoms. So now let's contrast those two structures for the last two molecules with ozone. Ozone has three times six electrons for 18 total. Now three atoms have to be connected in linear sequence, so we complete the octets of the non-central atom first, then count that 16 electrons, two left over, go on the central atom. So that's how I know I put two and only two electrons on the central atom. So now at this point here, I'd have a two plus formal charge on oxygen minus on the outside oxygens. So what I can do is pull in and make a double bond. So I can make a double bond, keep the electron pair on the central atom, keep three pairs of electrons around the third O and just two electron pairs now around the first O. Okay, so now, this molecule here is kind of interesting in that I could have made this double bond actually here instead and left the other double bond as it was. So now when I look at this structure here and recognize that I could have made this double bond and left the other one as a single, and left it as the minus charged atom, that I have a case here that's called resonance. I have an issue here where any time 
uh, a molecule can exist or we can sketch these Lewis structures that are equivalent as each other, yet different. So these are equivalent in what they're representing, yet they're different from each other. They're different because we're making the OO bond with a different set of the oxygen atoms. If I imagine numbering these atoms O1, 2, and 3, in one case I'm making the double bond between O's 1 and 2, in the other case between O's 2 and 3. Now, one important tidbit here, or thing to keep in mind, is that a Lewis structure is not a molecule. We're just trying to understand the bonding in molecules and better understand the, the ways we might picture molecules through sketching Lewis structures. Just because I draw Lewis structure A, let's call this one A, doesn't mean the molecule is compelled to exist as the atoms are depicted within that Lewis structure. Likewise, just because I can sketch B doesn't mean the real molecule exists as B. What we're going to find is that the real molecule of ozone is actually going to exist as the composite or the average of these two structures at all times. We'll see this in maybe better detail on the, on the next slide. So now this picture here is actually depicting two O atoms on the outside that look to be identical to each other. Being identical to each other is going to look like the case where we have this extra pair of electrons that's spreading itself out across the two bonds at any given time. So I might be able to sketch one resonance structure or the other, but the molecule is going to resonate at all times, that extra electron pair, across both of the um, bonds between the O atoms at the same time. So what ends up going on is we end up taking the three pairs of electrons and spreading them across the two OO bonds at any given moment, such that the bond between O appears to be about an order of one and a half, or a three halves order. Now where this plays a role is that generally double bonds are shorter than single bonds, so usually when we're looking at length, our double bonds are going to be shorter than our single bonds. So if we have an oxygen-oxygen single bond, the double bond usually is going to be shorter because we have more electrons pulling those nuclei together, acting as the glue holding the nuclei together. Now if we compare this to the case where we have like a three halves bond, like in the case of ozone, we have this extra bond here with this three halves bond, it should have a length kind of in the middle of the two. The key is that the two OO bond lengths in ozone are equal in length. So these two bond lengths, they're equal in bond distance due to this resonance effect. So one Lewis structure cannot depict ozone, we need two to depict ozone, and then when we see that they're equivalent yet different structures, we then know the real molecule of ozone at any given moment exists as the average of the composite of those structures. So the real bonds between the two O's on one side and the other of the molecule are exactly the same at any given moment. So we have this like three halves type bond. Now let's compare and contrast our Lewis structures for BF3 and for CO3 2 minus. 3 plus 3 times 7 is 24 total electrons for BF3. Then we have 4 plus 3 times 6 plus 2. That's also 24 electrons. Now when we're sketching our structures, I end up writing 3 fluorines. Satisfy their octets with lone pairs. That's 24 electrons. No electrons left over to go in the central atom, so we stand still. So I'm not taking boron to be deficient of an octet. I'm not drawing those electron pairs here just to fill an octet. I don't have any left over, so no electron pairs can go on boron. In the case of carbonate, something very similar happens. O atoms with their octet. Looks a lot like BF3. We have three single bonds, three octets being satisfied on the outer atoms. The central atom is not satisfying the octet rule, but we have no electrons left over, so I can't put an electron pair on the carbon atom. But the question might be, do I make a double bond? Now the issue with boron is there's no charge on this atom. There's no net charge on boron, yet there is a net formal charge on carbon. So I have a charge, and these little dots are negatively charged, so it might not be too crazy to think those negative particles will be pulled in to make a double bond. And if they are, the net result would be making that double bond and then reducing the magnitudes of formal charge as a result. So I end up making now a zero formal charge on carbon minus on the other two O's. 
then what we're going to see is resonance is going to kick in, and that electron pair is going to resonate to the other side of the molecule. Okay, so we're going to end up moving this double bond across the molecule such that all of the CO bonds in carbonate end up being equal in length of an order that we can say is about four thirds. So we have about four pairs of electrons being spread across the three CO bonds of the molecule. So now the difference between BF3 and carbonate ion is carbonate has a positive charge on carbon if we drew the structure with three single bonds. So we're going to pull in and make one multiple bond and we're not going to do that in the case of BF3. Now some molecules expand their octets and these molecules truly exist. We have 5 plus 5 times 7, that's 40 electrons to distribute in terms of the valence electrons for PCL5, central phosphorus, chlorine, 5 of them. Each of the chlorines satisfies an octet. I'm just going to draw 1 because that's 8 electrons around each of the chlorines. That's all of our electrons. We have none left over. So this would be a structure of PCL5. Phosphorus is expanding its octet. This is commonly done or possible for molecules um, in the third row of the periodic table. If we look at SF4, we have sulfur, four fluorines. I forgot to count my electrons. I'll do that in a second. My valence count would be six for sulfur, four times seven for the fluorines. That's 34 total electrons. If I distribute eight electrons per F, and there's four Fs, that's 32 electrons. We don't have zero left over here. We actually have two electrons left over. We have two electrons left over. We're going to put those on sulfur. Now sulfur ends up having one, two, three, four, five, six electrons surrounding it. Formal charge on sulfur here is zero. Formal charge on the fluorines is also zero. PCL5, the formal charge on the phosphorus, one, two, three, four, five. So it's zero as well. So not too crazy to think that these compounds are existing with central atoms that are relatively large that ultimately end up with zero formal charges on their atoms. Now one thing that's interesting is nitrogen is too small to do this. So NCl5 doesn't exist as a stable molecule like PCl5 does. Like OF4 doesn't exist as a stable compound like SF4 does. You can also form compounds like SF6, but not compounds like OF6. Now, we're not necessarily trying to have you predict which compounds exist or don't exist, but we're not going to generally expand octets in the case of stable molecules with central atoms in the second row of the periodic table. So let's look at our odd electron counts. So OH radical, or without a charge, you might contrast this with OH minus. OH minus, the difference here is 6 plus 1, 7 electrons total for OH, OH with a minus charge has that extra minus, so X, one extra electron. OH minus would have this Lewis structure. So we have eight electrons distributed. We got to kick one of the electrons off the O. It's really the only electron available to kick off. So we kick one of those electrons off, and then we have the Lewis structure for OH without the charge being this Lewis structure here. So one of the atoms with an odd count has to violate the octet rule. Interestingly, in this arrangement, both atoms have a zero formal charge. So minimize formal charges in the case of OH. Now in the case of IO, for uh, this molecule, we're going to have 7 plus 6 electrons. So that's 13 valence electrons that we're distributing. Maybe we'll contrast this with IO minus first. So IO minus picks up and has 14 electrons. So IO minus, we're going to have IO octets being satisfied. 14 electrons, just like something like Cl2 or F2. So single bond, lone pairs around all the atoms. So now the question is for IO, do you kick the electron off of the iodine or off the oxygen? Let's consider the two. Let's go off the iodine first. We kick the electron off the I. This almost looks good because you say, okay, we got a minus charge on the O. That's generally not a bad formal charge for oxygen, but the formal charge on iodine here ends up being positive for plus one. If we compare and say, well, what if we take the electron off of the O instead and come up with this Lewis structure? But this one ends up being better. This one's better because the formal charge of iodine is zero, seven minus seven. Formal charge of oxygen here is also zero for six. They give oxygen a zero count of electrons, minus one, two, three, four, five, six. 
So oxygen's formal charge is zero. So we're going to preferentially choose the Lewis structure that's better as the one that minimizes formal charges while keeping everything else equal. So if all else is equal, lower formal charges is better. Now in the case of NO, again, maybe we contrast this with NO minus. So that'd be five plus six plus one electron for 12 total. That's going to be a double bond structure for NO minus. NO minus puts a minus formal charge on, and that's okay. I mean, in this molecule, um, the oxygen has a zero formal charge and has a negative. We have no choice. We have to satisfy the octet rule on both atoms, and that's just what simply results. But when I'm trying to consider which atom I kick the um, electron off of, it's a pretty easy decision to kick it off the end because that ends up forming that's a little bit. That ends up forming five electrons around the N for a zero formal charge, six electrons on the O for a zero formal charge. As opposed to if we kicked an uh, oxygen electron off, then we'd have an odd count on O and a positive formal charge on O and a negative on N, maximizing a formal charge. So the better Lewis structure for NO looks like this one here. So let's look at this case of like BF3 again. In the case of BF3, we might have considered taking one of these electron pairs, making that double bond like we did in the case of carbonate ion. And if we do, we end up with this double bond. If we end up with this double bond here, this is actually pretty bad because we're putting a formal charge of plus on fluorine and now a negative formal charge on, on uh, boron. So the weird thing with this structure would be why would we take an atom that doesn't have a charge and pull electrons in towards it where we don't even have a positive charge to pull those negative electrons in. And then the result is our lesser electronegative atom is picking up a negative charge at the expense of our more electronegative atom of fluorine. So this is a pretty bad idea. In fact, fluorine's more electronegative in the real molecule BF3, the fluorine's trying to pull the single bond closer towards itself. The real charge of F should actually be partially negative in this compound, not positive. So these are really not even less important. These are pretty bad structures to consider for BF3. The real molecule BF3 is going to be much more likely to have partial negative charges around the F atoms and then a positive charge on, on boron, not a negative charge on boron. So BF3 is happy in the Lewis structure to stand uh, still or stay pat, if you will, with uh, a fewer than an octet surrounding the boron atom. So there's no need to satisfy the octet rule using multiple bonds in a molecule like BF3. Now let's discuss multiple central atoms for a minute. So this molecule here just has more than one central atom. We end up with a CH3, C. Now you may wonder here, do we go a linear sequence with this? The problem is, is I'm gonna have a hard time coming up with four bonds on that oxygen atom um, if I go with this linear sequence. Instead, what I'm gonna have to do is maybe put one O up and the other O on the side and then have an OH on one of them. Two lone pairs, two bonds, very common for O. So I can get into the structure here just by understanding the nature of O, forming with two bonds, one on either side of the O in this case. Now this O here is gonna form two bonds just with a double bond. So we make a double bond just like in CO2, two lone pairs. So for some of these organic molecules, we can take advantage of carbon forms with four bonds, not five, not three. And then oxygen tends to form with two bonds, two lone pairs. And then uh, we do that with both the O's. H tends to form just one bond. So that's acetic acid. This group here is the carboxylic acid group, a pretty ubiquitous uh, acidic group in organic compounds. This chart here is reviewing some of our bond strengths. One of the things that's neat is just sort of reminding ourselves that our covalent bond strengths are in the order of about 400, give or take, kJs per mole. Double bonds are stronger, though, than single bonds. If you compare the CO single to the CO double, you see that the double bond a lot stronger in the case of its bond strength. Um, the carbon-carbon uh, bond a lot stronger than the carbon-carbon single bond. So if you look at the CC uh, double bond versus the CC single bond, you see that the double bond strength is higher. So more bonding pairs of electrons strengthens uh, the covalent bond. So now we can compare and contrast our bond strengths and lengths. If we use the NN triple bond, strong bond, and its triple has six bonding pairs of electrons. If you compare that with the NN double bond, what happens is the bond lengthens, so the NN double bond is longer than the NN triple bond, and it's also weaker as a result. 
the NN single bond is even longer and then even weaker. And so our bond strength, the NN triple bond, is stronger than the NN double bond, is stronger than the NN single bond. And then in terms, so that's in terms of strength. So triple bond, stronger than double, stronger than single. And in the case of length, this trend goes the opposite way, that our NN triple bond is shorter than the double bond, which is shorter than the single bond. So fewer bonding pairs of electrons lengthens the bond in the single bond between the two ends. That serves to weaken the bond and give it the weakest possible bond. Now finally, let's come up with a contrast between bond uh, lengths and their Lewis structures. So carbon monoxide would be four plus six, that's 10 electrons. So that's gonna form the triple bond. Diatomic molecules are slightly different in their Lewis structures than maybe some of the bigger molecules. For diatomic, we're always gonna satisfy the octet rule when we can. And only when we have an odd count might we not satisfy one of the octet rules. And then we're careful with which one we're choosing, looking at their formal charges to be our guiding uh, light, if you will, for making that decision. So we get a triple bond in the case of carbon monoxide, which what's really interesting here is this gives oxygen a positive formal charge and carbon a negative formal charge. But we have no other choice for a Lewis structure that would satisfy the octet rule of both atoms. Now the only possibility for CO that might be another considerable Lewis structure would be one that just doesn't violate or that, that doesn't follow the octet rule. So this octet rule of carbon's not being followed here. We only have six electrons surrounding it. This structure here would give zero formal charges to both atoms, but is not the best Lewis structure because for diatomic molecules, we're always gonna satisfy the octet rule. And then um, in the case of CO, we have no choice of where the plus and minus charges end up as a result of that, because we have to use a triple bond um, to satisfy both atoms octets based on the electron count. Now in the case of CO2, we saw this earlier double bond and then in the case of carbonate ion, like we saw earlier, we have this Lewis structure here where we have a four thirds type bond. If you maybe even throw in one more example, if you compare it to methanol, if you said CH3OH, how does it compare? We have a CH3 and then CO single bond to an OH. So the key here would be that our triple bond is going to be the shortest. The carbon oxygen distance in CO2 will be a little bit longer than in the CO molecule. The bonds in carbonate would all be the same. So all of these CO bonds are the same length, despite one of them looks like a double, the other two look like a single. We have this effect of resonance. We'll explain that a bit more perhaps as we go along, if that's still confusing on why this is the case, but all the bonds end up being the same in carbonate and being described of about a four thirds order. And then the bonds in methanol would be the longest because in this molecule we have the CO single bond and that's gonna be longer than this four thirds type bond. So we can use Lewis structures to come up with predictions of things like bond length, and then we can maybe compare against some actual bond lengths to hopefully see that our model's making sense. So we use uh, Lewis structures to come up with a model to help us understand the bonding in molecules. Some structures are going to have resonance going on, so we need more than one Lewis structure to describe some molecules. Other molecules like CO2 or CO, one Lewis structure is fine for understanding a majority of their properties. Well, that's all for this video. Thanks for the attention. 